This is uh, Dr. Abdullah, uh, Abdullah from, uh, uh, he's a political scientist at uh, UAEU, and he submitted this uh, video, uh, and he's going to talk just a little bit about the future of Egypt as he sees it. Egypt is full of opportunities. The Arab world is full of opportunities. We have, you know, educated people, we have middle class, we have, uh, there is a lot that, you know, and we have resources too, there is a lot that can go for Egypt. If Egypt is a democratic country, and if Egypt is a free of corruption country, and if Egypt is, you know, a, 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 a law binding and institutionalized, I think that the resources is what what counts, which makes, you know, the potential for Egypt emerging as the new Arab tiger, say, in five years down the road. Indeed, one could even think a little bit further to see Egypt in the long run, probably by 2020, as the Brazil of the Arab world. What will happen to Egypt? What, what does the future look like? The future, in the, in the, in the long, in the, in the short term, there will be teething problems. And I can see, you know, there are intervention, indirect intervention. For example, the G8, they budgeted $20 billion to help the governments in Egypt and in Tunisia. Uh, and they said that we will support the revolution. We will support the outcome of this Arab Spring, as they call it. But when you come to, when you look at the practical terms, there is no mechanism. There is no actually money uh, budgeted for this. And they said, go to IMF, International Monetary Funds, uh, to, to negotiate. And we know in the third world what it means to go and talk to International Monetary Funds. A huge condition crippling conditions. So what if, you know, saying, okay, we are going to give you $10 billion, but you have actually to keep the sanction against Gaza, not to help the Palestinian. You have to continue playing the role of the peace uh, broker in the Middle East. You have actually to be with us if there is a conflict with Iran tomorrow, for example. So there are strings. You know. So it's nothing, nothing actually. This makes me extremely suspicious. I think there was a tendency on the part of Western analysts to kind of see the Egyptian revolution as a secular revolution. And it's true that there weren't Islamic slogans and all of that. But I think what's really interesting now to see is that today the Muslim Brotherhood is the single most powerful political force in Egypt. And if there were free elections tomorrow, it's hard to think of another party that would really be able to compete effectively. And not only the Muslim Brotherhood, because at the end of the day, the Muslim Brotherhood is conservative. They take positions that many of us aren't going to feel comfortable with, whether it's on women's rights or position towards Israel, the whole list of things. But there is actually a group further to the right, and that's been one of the big surprises of the post-revolutionary period, the rise of Salafi groups in Egypt. And a lot of people didn't see this coming, but now we're seeing not one Salafi group, but three Salafi groups thinking about forming political parties. So they're going to enter into the electoral arena. Could they win 5%, 10%? Possibly. And if they do, they're going to play a very influential role. We see, for example, in Israel how far-right religious parties with only 5% of the vote are able to really control the agenda. So that's going to be very interesting to see. And if you add the Salafis with the Muslim Brotherhood with um, some progressive Islamist groups, we're talking about perhaps 50% or more. Now, I, I don't think that we should get too alarmist about this, but I think we should be realistic and say the liberals in Egypt aren't very strong right now. And I think, unfortunately, they spend a lot more time protesting than they do organizing. And I think they have to kind of take a step back and reassess that strategy. I think that the biggest danger of of Egypt's transition to, to, to democracy failing is not so much the takeover of Islamists or even extremism, but that Egypt turn into essentially a failed state. That we have a situation where there's a quasi-democracy at the top, but really there's failed institutions at the bottom and, and there's no law and order. Um, Egypt becomes a place of, of essentially warring groups uh, it, it just descends into chaos. And what that will do is de destabilize the entire region. So it's not so much that I'm, I'm concerned about um, Egypt's domestic 
policies being too conservative or, or, the, or that minorities will be treated badly, but that the entire region is destabilized by an Egypt that spirals into chaos. Muslim Brotherhoods, are they you know, posing a danger to Egyptian people or to the West? You know, that's, that's the biggest question. Always, you know, when we talk about Muslim Brotherhoods, we are not actually talking about the danger of the supposed danger of the Muslim Brotherhoods on Egyptian people or in the region. So always we look at the, at the, to at the Muslim Brotherhoods actually from the eyes of the West. They are dangerous for the West. They are dangerous because they, they could abrogate the peace treaty with Israel. If Muslim Brotherhood tomorrow saying that we are going to respect the Camp David Agreement and stick to it, and even put pressure on Hamas and Fatah to sign uh, any peace deal with the Israelis, they will be loved by the West. Uh, the Muslim Brotherhood is nonviolent and is committed to participating in the democratic process. And I think it's about time for Western governments to understand that and engage with Islamist groups and start a dialogue. And I think it's very problematic now that the US has no channels of dialogue with these groups because it's been afraid for such a long time to move in that direction. Why? Because as Americans, we were afraid that if there were free elections in the Middle East, right. Islamists would come to power. We have to get over that. So I agree with you 100%. And you know what? If Egyptians want to vote for the Muslim Brotherhood, we have to respect that. That's what democracy is all about, right? The will of the majority. Okay. If I may just add, I mean, I'm, I'm happy with the Muslim Brotherhood ruling, the Salafis ruling, anyone ruling. Even so myself. Even that, <laughs> especially yourself. So long as the rules of the game, and, and by that I mean checks and balances in the system are in place. Uh, I'm perfectly understanding of what is happening right now in, in Egypt, and I see it in Libya. By the way, in Libya today, the most organized groups on the ground are the Muslim Brotherhood. They've been the ones who, the only, some of the, only, one of the only groups that have survived 42 years of Gaddafi's repression. They, in fact, made a pact with him recently or with one of his sons and were willing to go along. And when the youth of Libya revolted, they changed direction. But they are right now on the ground. They're very well organized. And if elections were held today, they will win outright. I have absolutely no problem with a democratic experiment that brings in winners and losers and, and where people compete on, on platforms, on ideas on policies as opposed to on whether it's halal or haram. Hence the idea of checks and balances being put in place. Constitutional guarantees, separation of powers. If these bases of a normal, functioning, stable, democratic system are guaranteed or are at least protected, uh, I think as Shadi and uh, Abdul Hadi, uh, al Fadl uh, have indicated, Abdul Bari, uh, I think anyone should be able to compete and win and lose through the ballot box.